I think we can start now. Um, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, to our panel uh, of speakers who have made the uh, incredible effort to be with us today, to join us uh, on this uh, program, to speak about the uh, humanitarian, dire humanitarian situation in Yemen as a direct result of the ongoing uh, aggression against the state of Yemen. Um, I We use the word aggression because it is to contrast it with a civil war. If this was a civil war, we wouldn't have a coalition of many countries pounding one country to smithereen, specifically targeting its uh, infrastructure, and a great deal of that infrastructure included food storages, farms, and any place where the factories, any place where there was food production going on. And uh, quite a lot of experts on the scene in Yemen have concluded that the Saudi coalition's uh, policy in uh, approaching the matter of Yemen, of, of, of trying to uh, be in, in a position of controlling the uh, destiny of the people of Yemen or to controlling their country, occupying it, was using hunger as a weapon of war. This is a very, very unfortunate uh, uh, decision to make by anybody because it is not political. It is very, very inhumane, and I can assure you that it is so illegal that the consequences are very serious. And it's just a matter of time until the people of Yemen and their uh, governing uh, parties are able to uh, take the necessary legal steps, which I'm sure they will do in due course, uh, to, to, to hold those who are responsible for this accountable. Everybody who has been observing the situation in Yemen for the past six years have confirmed that using hunger as a weapon of war is just completely wrong, is out of order. The humanitarian situation is particularly painful to look at, to think about. As we were speaking, there are children dying literally every 10 minutes. Um, th there are people who are dying of uh, serious diseases like uh, cancer, unable to get medication because ships that carry food, fuel and medicine are detained unlawfully by the Saudi-led coalition. Uh, and so the people are just suffering. It's just ongoing torture. If you can imagine Yemen as just one big torture camp, that's basically what it is. Um, don't be misled about hearing things about like the southern parts, which they refer to as the freed parts, as being better. In reality, those parts are far worse off than the northern parts that are under the control of uh, Sana'a government. And uh, in so far as they have total lack of security, they have widespread terrorism problems there. And so it's chaos on chaos throughout the Yemen. And that, entire, that chaos is entirely attributable to the Saudi-led coalition's intervention in the affairs of Yemen on the 26th of March 2015. And they were hoping that by going in there and pounding the Yemen to smithereen, within days or weeks they would be able to control the whole of Yemen and uh, force the Houthi, what they refer to as Houthis, which in fact is the Sana'a government, which contains all uh, political parties of Yemen, uh, sur will, will, will cause them to surrender and submit and, and give them their country and let them do what they like with it. But six years on, that didn't happen. The people of Yemen are continuing. 80% of the population are under the uh, uh, control or under the uh, supervision, under the care of uh, Sana'a government, uh, mostly uh, IDPs from uh, the parts that they uh, refer to as, uh, as freed parts, which they are not freed, as I've just explained. And this variety of uh, misleading things like internationally recognized government, a restoration of those, or uh, enforcing uh, UN's res UN Security Council Resolution 2216, which again is a lie because that resolution was passed three weeks after the commencement of the Saudi-led uh, coalition intervention in Yemen. And so all in all, there is no legal basis for Saudi-led coalition intervening in the affairs of Yemen and using military power so devastating to the country and its people for the past six years that it can only be referred to as an act of aggression because it is, and I am saying this to you, having consulted with great many experts on the uh, matter of international law, great many lawyers have agreed with me on this point and they all aver and confirm that this is uh, an aggression, this is not a, a civil war as the Saudi coalition and their backers often refer to. And so today we have an impeccable panel of speakers 
speakers, exceptional people of uh, great uh, respect and uh, personality in, 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 from the UK and Norway and the US. We have a panel of speakers uh, who have got vast experience in the uh, world of uh, human rights campaigns and uh, aid provision. Uh, we have a an award-winning journalist as well who, for some technical reason, has not yet arrived and we're waiting for him to join us later on. Um, so uh, we, I'm going to start with our first speaker from Britain, uh, Stephen Bell. Stephen Bell is the treasurer of uh, Stop the War Coalition, an organization that was set up in uh, in 2003 to over, to overcome the problem about the uh, proposed then Iraqi uh, intervention by uh, Britain and the US and their and their allies the debacle is the other expression to describe that Stephen has been uh, tirelessly working on the uh, field of in the field of human rights and supporting uh, vulnerable and oppressed people in the world such as uh, the Palestinian cause. He's been at, right at the forefront there in campaigning for their rights. He's been also in relation to the uh, cause of Yemen for the past six years, tirelessly and, and uh, with absolute uh, admirable uh, integrity. He has been supporting the cause of Yemen, We're holding uh, events, holding demonstrations, uh, joining inside events at the UN uh, Human Rights Council, speaking about the uh, situation in Yemen and what has been happening. So, in effect, Steve has now become more or less one of us, a member of the Yemeni community, insofar as he knows so much about the situation in Yemen. And um, Stephen is an outstanding person, an outstanding human being, and we are honored to have him with us today to speak about the situation in Yemen, and perhaps in particular in relation to our own government in the UK's involvement and participation in the worst man-made humanitarian catastrophe. Stephen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kim, for very kind uh, words. Um, <clears throat> Firstly, I think that we have to locate the whole issue of the blockade um, within the framework of the general offensive war against the uh, Yemeni people. Um, I very much agree with the statement made by the Brooking senior fellow, Bruce Rydell, when he described the blockade as, quote, an offensive military operation that kills civilians. And I think that is exactly uh, what it is. So we have to aim for uh, the lifting of the blockade and the ending of the war simultaneously. It's hard often to grasp the impact of the war and the blockade on the Yemeni people as a whole. Um, I think one of the ways to do this is to look at the its whole impact upon the economy of uh, Yemen. If you take the um, total product, the gross domestic product of uh, Yemen in 2014, that represented $43.2 billion. By 2020, as a result of the war and the uh, blockade, that had been halved to less than, uh, more than halved to $21.45 billion. And at the same time as the total economy has shrunk in half, the population has, of Yemen has grown. So that in 2014, it was 25.8 million Yemenis. By 2020, it was 29.8. So the economy has shrunk, the population has grown, and the extent of this is that the average per person, per capita GDP in 2014 was $1,674. By 2020, that had shrunk to $720. And you translate that into the living standards and the welfare of the people of Yemen, and then you explain the greatest catastrophe on the face of the earth today. In terms of the um, situation, I don't think there's much argument, certainly from UN sources and uh, multilateral organizations um, on its severity. Um, the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, for instance, recently stated that by June, half the population, 16.2 million people, will face crisis levels of, uh, food, of uh, food insecurity. Meanwhile, with a new 
um, US government in place, we are looking for some sort of progress, some sort of breakthrough in these uh, circumstances. Unfortunately, at the moment, the US government is still pretending that the um, Saudi Arabian government's proposed ceasefire is somehow a new proposal um, and that the US government has even said that, quote, um, the Saudi government is committed and keen to find a solution to the conflict. Well, if that is the case, please explain this. In um, March, according to the Yemen data product, uh, project, there were 178 mis uh, air raids. This compares to, um, th this makes it the highest degree of air, number of air raids since October. And yet, supposedly, the coalition are uh, looking for a peace. On the contrary, the situation worsens the and the absolute crisis of the Saudi project is asserting itself. Um, so diplomacy is uh, uh, being used to hide the fact there are no new initiatives currently underway. I, um, it, we could see whether there was real initiatives underway in um, March when we came to the donors conference to assist because obviously people have spent six years destroying Yemen so one would expect that the donors would now be anxious if there is if they are moving to a solution to increase their commitment on the rebuilding of uh, Yemen. Now, the UN's humanitarian plan for 2021 the, the estimates is 3.85 billion dollars needed so far, they've received just uh, $442 million, just about a twelfth of what they need for the year. Yet, the total pledge at the, at the, at the March conference was $1.67 billion, less than half of what is needed for the whole year. And the people pledging are somehow um, suggesting that um, their commitment to the solution, Yemen's uh, solution and solving the humanitarian problems is real and substantial. Now, these are the same people who last year, while continuing the war, um, managed to halve the amount of aid given to Yemen on the previous year. So as the situation is getting worse, the amount of aid is declining, not increasing. And Unfortunately, these same governments, particularly the British and the United States governments, are boasting, actually boasting about the amount of aid that they are giving to Yemen. Well, let's look at the facts. The US government, since the start of the war, has provided 3.4 billion in aid to Yemen. Sounds a lot of money. However, you then compare that to the fact that in that same period, the US government has sold $64.1 billion worth of arms to Riyadh. $64.1 billion. That's 19 times more profits they've made from the war than aid they've actually given. We'll take the, 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 the British government. The British government it says we have given $1 billion in aid um, to Yemen since the start of the war. In the same time, their public, pu their public, the figures they publicised indicate that they have sold arms worth five point three billion dollars uh, to the um, sorry uh, pounds pounds um, to the um, to Riyadh. That would be five times as much in destroying the country as in aiding the country. But actually, that's probably an underestimate. Um, Andrew Feinstein, who is a uh, acknowledged expert on the um, world arms trade, says that the figure is probably closer to 10 billion on the basis that um, the British government issues licenses, which some of which can be uh, a single license can cover a number of um, multiple um, purchases. So at least five and perhaps 10 times as much profit has been made by the um, uh, 
British government and British firms um, than has been spent in um, uh, aiding uh, Yemen. So uh, it, to finish my closing remarks, I think that's where we are. We are at a position where formally the powers which are aiding the, the uh, Saudi coalition are providing it with an alibi um, for its continued war upon the people of Yemen. And at the same time, they're profiting hugely uh, from that very same war. So I think that the humanitarian situation <coughs> will continue to worsen unless we are able to break this logjam, whereby on the one hand, they're saying we favor peace, we favor aid. And on the other hand, they're pursuing a war and making a lot of money. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was amazing, detailed analysis of the economic uh, side of the situation. And yes, you are right. Uh, there is a great deal of uh, benefits for those who are warmongers. They, you know, they they're more interested in making profits out of the uh, blood of other human beings, and nobody really matters. And so, it's really refreshing for us to hear from uh, a, a British man uh, in England uh, saying it exactly as it is with such confidence and bravery. Much respect to you, sir, and we very much appreciate your support throughout. And uh, no doubt I will come back to you because there are a couple of other questions that I have, uh, I need to be uh, putting to you. Um, we're now going to uh, move on to our next speaker, who is an amazing doctor from Norway, all the way from Norway. Uh, Dr. Trond Ali Lindstad has uh, been a devoted, uh, caring person above his profession as a doctor uh, in, in terms of ethics. You know, this is the, the best example you can get about doctors being deeply ethical and, and being caring about human beings and their welfare. Dr. Trond has been very successful at setting up uh, orphanages in uh, in, in um, difficult situations such as Somalia where he has had an orphanage there very successfully running it and uh, he also has other projects uh, to help people vulnerable people oppressed people in Norway itself as well as overseas and uh, very recently he has started working in uh, Yemen as well he has been working in the uh, matter of uh, assisting uh, widows uh, get, make, a, make their own living out of uh, workshops and uh, projects such as that, self-sufficiency projects to help widows and their orphans make their own living, uh, bearing in mind what's happening in terms of the uh, economic situation in the country. Basically, everyone is, is, is facing literally uh, famine there. So uh, without much, Dr. Trond is also the founder of the Islamic Endowment, Endowment which uh, does all these projects under the organization known as Orthagen Stiftelsen. I hope I have said that right, Dr. Trond, and I leave you the floor to say it the correct way to pronounce the organization's name. Thank you very much for being with us today, sir. Thank you. First, I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to this conference. It's an honor and it's a pleasure for me to be together with you discussing the issue of Yemen. And maybe I'd like to start like this, that, dear friends, please let me first send my best regards to the people of Yemen. Strong, proud, and committed for self-determination and independence from regional and international powers wanting to control and govern them. Locally, Saudi Arabia and its allies, internationally, United States, France, England, and other powers. Honorable Yemeni people facing such powers and resisting their unjust attempts for control and dominance. This is a costly matter for the Yemeni people to stand up in this position of struggle and resistance. The enemies, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, United States, Western powers have turned to open terrorism to try to subdue the people of Yemen. The result 
is the worst humanitarian crisis in over time. I think all of you know the details in this situation. So the question is, what can be done? Friends of Yemen have important tasks in trying to stop the war. Friends of Yemen must expose the character of the war, foreign powers trying to bomb and terrorize the people of Yemen into submission. Friends of Yemen must consider what kind of help can be offered also on the humanitarian level. All of these matters are most important for us, friends of Yemen, and we should get involved in all of them. I am representing Urtehagen International. This is a non-profit social institution in Oslo, Norway, and we are happy to be invited to establish and support a self-sufficient project in Amara, Yemen. The project is to make a sewing center for widowed women of martyrs in Yemen to give them their own economical base. Please let me see, say a few words about the project itself. But maybe first, if you allow me to present some of our experiences and our backgrounds for getting involved in this project, a great honor for us, actually. Urtagen International is a non-profit institution doing social, social and humanitarian work. And we have established some projects, which I think is important as a background for us, even to support now people in Yemen. I should try to, if you allow me, show some photos, inform you about these activities, which is our activities, and we hope to bring our experiences also further to Yemen. I know that you have a well experienced technical person trying to help us. Maybe I should ask him if he can present some of these matters. If not, I will try it myself. But it would be nice if indeed if he could help us. So if we, I ask if this is possible first. Thank you. Um, yes, sir, sir. As far as the technical uh, assistant is concerned, uh, we only received the videos from the sister, unfortunately, who I understand is physically not well at the moment. And so perhaps you can uh, you can put the photographs to us about the background of your organization. When we come to the video, we will play the video for you. I will see if we can manage. Thank you. Thank you. Urtagen International. We are operating an orphanage. I think again we returned to other activities also for an inf in, uh, information for you please Urtagen, we are going we are doing some medic uh, humanitarian work in Boro in Somalia north of Som Somalia in Somaliland this is Urtagen in that area we have established an orphanage in this city Somali city we are showing you some of the orphans the children we have some 100 children receiving help living in that center. We are glad to see that they are well taken care of, we hope. They are, we hope they are happy uh, staying in our orphanage. We also have a handicap center for handicapped children, taking care of them, daycare center. We have built a school for the children. Some of the school, uh, some of the children, when they finish the ground school education, some of them are moved and moving to higher education we are happy really to be 
have been able to help them into these uh, steps. We have a focus on Palestine. When the Israeli bombed Gaza, terrorized Gaza, we collected money, we bought an ambulance, we sent it from Oslo down to Gaza, helping people suffering from the Israeli bombardments. We collected money, we bought an ambulance and sent it to Somalia, a hospital in Somalia. We are, have friendly relations with Palestinian football teams, sporting teams in Gaza. We are supporting money also to social institutions, Bethlehem. Palestine always is in our mind. We have good friends, we cooperate with them. We call the, the association Friends of Jerusalem, Imams, the Bishop of uh, Jerusalem, Rabbi Weiss, a Jewish rabbi, uh, rabbi, part of the Netura Karta, which is Jews against Zionism, Jews against the state of Israel, joining the Friends of Jerusalem Al Quds. We are arranging demonstrations. We also have relations with the Christian group for orphans in the Philippines. They thank for frontliners. We hope to be front, frontliners indeed. Who is supporting our work? We are operating a secondary school for immigrant ladies. We are happy with this school we are operating. They are clever girls, ladies working. They are collecting money and they are strong ladies. They also take part in this work. They also can do it. This is some of the teachers. We have sport activities for the women. Be careful, she's strong. And this is the board of Urtehagen Stiftelse, board of Urtehagen International. Strong ladies everywhere. With this background, we are happy now to turn also to Yemen to see if we can be of some help in Yemen for the people of Yemen. We are in the streets. We have a caravan distributing materials about the war. We have started to collect money. And we are happy that we have been invited for activities within this old building. We are there starting the sewing center for widowed children of martyrs. We have bought sewing machines, different kinds. Ladies are learning to handle this handicraft and already they are making uh, clothes which they are selling on the market and getting economical base for themselves. This is part of the closest they have made recently, Urtehagen, together with Al Sara Association. We are happy indeed for this work, and we hope we hope to continue this work. We hope that we will be able to establish similar centers el elsewhere in Yemen. So, I invite you, all of you, to take part in this work if you have time and would like to do it. You can have our address, our bank accounts also, from the organizers of this television program. So this is part of our social work, and we want to expand it into Yemen, because friends of Yemen, they need a lot of challenges to be handled, and we are happy to be there. So thank you indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trond. That was an amazing uh, uh, display of uh, very, very valuable information about your uh, vast amount of work all over the world. I was only aware of your projects in uh, Africa, 
But I'm really pleased to see that you're also active in Palestine and elsewhere. And of course, you're more than welcome to come and uh, join us in our efforts to help the people of Yemen. And I can confirm that we have recently worked with your organization in the establishing of the uh, uh, sewing center for the orphans in, uh, uh, and, and widows in Amran. And that has, well, was a very successful project. Already, uh, the ladies are producing beautiful dresses which can be sold for their Eid coming for uh, after one month, after month of Ramadan and that would be inshallah very uh, profitable for the ladies and they will have something to survive on I personally really admire the uh, clothing that I saw a liner that I saw myself if these were available in the uh, shops here in the UK I would buy for myself quite a few I can assure you they're just beautiful and so the talent is there the manpower is there the desire is there the willingness is there but the support is not there and let's talk about financial support in yemen and of course the uh, meetings they have at the un level with the uh, donors uh, conferences um let's be honest firstly a lot of the money that the saudi regime and the emirati regime quite often speak about when people complain about their uh, crimes in yemen in specifically about why they are starving millions of people in yemen the, the saudi regime and the emirati regime's often response is that oh they are giving a lot of aid to these people now where does this aid go is the very 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 important question firstly they are insisting that Mr. Hadi and his Quango, whose term under the Gulf Initiative had expired in February 2012, are still the government of Yemen, which is impossible legally, politically, diplomatically, and under any other uh, heading that you can think about. People whose term had ended, had ended. That does, it, it means you cannot insist that these people are the government simply because you have a lot of money and and you can influence and uh, use uh, your your, your uh, money to silence the un and other people so this the, the the suggestion that these people are the legitimate government i am telling you is a gross abuse and violation of the sovereignty of the state of yemen and its people and gross abuse and violation of the vienna Con vienna convention on diplomatic relations because whilst they say it's the legitimate government what they really mean in essence is we will compel bully influence countries of the world to not recognize any other government for yemen except these people which who we we choose that's basically what it means and unfortunately a lot of countries in the world are going along with this without asking the question how does this legitimacy arise in the first place and is it just going on six years later with with, with there no being any end any end inside is this a kingdom or a republic yemen is a republic it has a, it has a constitution the constitution as all lawyers will tell you doesn't die simply because there is a change of government or there is a revolu by revolution or a coup the constitution is always remains alive this is a concept in law internationally known as the grand norm so the grand norm hasn't died in yemen and there are people operating it today and it's in sana'a so these people are being deliberately starved to deny them the right to govern their country they also enjoy massive public support millions of people come to the streets of sana'a and elsewhere to show support to this government in sana'a but what the saudi coalition and their backers are saying that is that we will starve everybody we will collectively punish everyone and cause them to 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 suffer and and uh, we will bomb them and we will also uh, cause a famine there by detaining ships that have gone through un search mechanism and have received passes to dock at uh, port of hudaida but we will commit act of piracy against these ships that carry food fuel and medicine to force the people of yemen to accept what we are superimposing on them as their government the alleged uh, legitimate uh, government whose term as i have just explained had ended with the expiry of the gulf initiative in february 2014 so where does the money of aid coming from these two countries go 
the money obviously gets paid to Hadi and his people. That is, if they actually pay the money. As far as I'm aware, a lot of the money hasn't even been paid to the aid agencies. They are still awaiting a lot of the money that they were pledged or promised ages ago. They haven't received it. And so it, what, what money gets paid then to what they call as the Central Bank of Yemen, which is basically uh, 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 a forceful removal of the Central Bank of Yemen from the capital Sana'a into its temporary accommodation in Aden. And it, the bank is, uh, obviously gets looted quite a lot. Uh, the, the, its, fund, it, its funds are going completely haywire insofar as they're issuing a lot of new uh, bank notes to cover their losses. And in reality, the money that, the, any money that goes into Yemen goes into the hands of these traitors who live in Riyadh, Cairo, and Istanbul hotels. And they are buying assets like nobody's business. Um, if, even in London, if there are some parts in London which now contain assets being purchased by these traitors from money that they receive from the Saudi coalition and elsewhere. And so they have, they have been buying luxurious hotels, restaurants, real estates in Cairo, in Istanbul, and even in London, and possibly Liverpool, because at least one person who is based in Liverpool, I know of, has been receiving payment directly from the Saudi, Saudi led coalition to come on the BBC and other channels to tell a pack of lies about the situation in Yemen to mislead the world uh, as part of the propaganda. The least paid of them is this one, based in Liverpool, receives $100,000 per annum. And I received this information from leaked documents coming from the Saudi government itself. They often leak these uh, lists in order to uh, possibly encourage other people to sell their country and join their ranks. That's what I believe. Or just expose these cheap traitors who are selling their countries for a fistful of dollars. So... The money doesn't go to the people of Yemen because people in the, in the south are as starving as the people in the north. Only a couple of days ago, my colleagues uh, have sent me a video. Uh, we, I am the uh, foreign uh, relations uh, officer for the uh, Southern Peace and Conciliation Association, and they often supply me with very important information about the situation in the southern parts. And an old woman in the uh, Abian area, Zanjibar, is crying. It breaks my heart just to remember, to, to remember that scene. It's about a one-minute one, vi one video. This woman, an old woman, crying, saying, and she looks skinny. We are hungry. We are starving. Why is the world left us uh, like this? We have no food. We have nothing happening to us. So basically, to, to wrap it up, any money paid in aid for Yemen, whether it's from Britain, from the US, any other country, or even the Saudi-led coalition, does not go to the people of Yemen. It goes to the pockets of the traitors. It goes to fund Aqab and Daesh to buy them weapons. And they, get, they do get actually weapons directly from the Saudi regime because when the uh, Sana'a government army and, co and popular committees uh, recaptured the uh, Al-Bayda governorate, they have also captured a whole load of uh, Aqab and Daesh militia terrorists. And these were nationalities from Chechenia, from ba Bangladesh, from Pakistan, from Sudan, from Egypt. Nationalities from all over the place have been brought into Yemen. I believe they were exported from Syria. Having failed in Syria, they have now been uh, rehoused in Yemen, as it were. And they also found caches of weapons with these terrorists. And these caches of weapons clearly bear Saudi emblem, Saudi flags everywhere. So they are arming terrorists, known terrorists in Yemen. Of course, Jastalo also declares them to be involved in the uh, mother of all terrorism, 9-11. And to date, we don't see even the progressives in the U.S. taking any steps to uh, prosecute this regime for being implicated or involved in terrorism. Instead, we, they are getting diplomatic, um, political, economic, and all manner of support from the U.S. and the U.K. to continue their genocidal campaign in Yemen. It's no exaggeration to say genocidal because that is exactly what's happening. As I just explained, it's heartbreaking to see people in the southern governments, which are supposed to be free, crying of hunger. Elderly people have nothing to eat. 
Likewise, children, they are dying at the same rate as, 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 as is the situation in the northern parts where food, fuel and medicine is actually denied deliberately in order to force the people to uh, submit to the uh, imperial agendas. This is nothing short of imperial agenda. If you don't believe what I am saying, I, I, I would strongly recommend that you read widely about what's happening in Yemen from independent, independent sources, in particular about the policy of using hunger as a weapon of war uh, uh, in a report from uh, Professor Martha Mundy uh, called the uh, strategies of the war by the Saudi coalition in Yemen. This is a very compelling report. It's not very long, but it's amazingly well researched and well written and uh, does clarify why even aid agencies have been abysmal in their uh, supposedly a political uh, stance. In fact, it is highly political because it's very much pro-Saudi coalition by their silence, by their not speaking up as they're supposed to. Um, one, one last thing I'm going to say is that there are four million disabled people in Yemen as a direct result of this war. I suppose this figure has not come out from uh, any of the UN agencies, but it has come out from a Yemeni lady expert who uh, is uh, who works with NGOs, and she was part of uh, a, co a conference held by the uh, uh, Sana'a Allied uh, Ambassador to Yemen in Syria, and this, uh, this event is has been recorded. I was heartbroken to, 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 to hear her speak about this figure. It's very shocking. If you have four million people disabled in a country going through what is what's happening in Yemen for six years, you can also take some of that figure, maybe very large numbers of that figure, into those who are also facing famine. So imagine being disabled, IDP, facing famine in Yemen today and the Saudi coalition continues is pounding only yesterday apparently they dropped they they, they uh, raided Marib with, with uh, at least 20 airstrikes and quite a lot of these airstrikes often are targeted on civilians the civilians are being punished for uh, having uh, the dignity or the the, the the fortitude to demand that they are the owners of their own sovereignty and uh, decision makers of their own country's future. And one last thing I will say about the uh, policy about starving people or using hunger as a weapon of war. Uh, Mr. Mohammed Abdus Salam, who is the team leader of the national uh, uh, negotiations for, uh, allied to the Sana'a government based in Muscat, Mr. Abdus Salam said that at the last uh, peace negotiations in Kuwait, the U.S. envoy was present there. The U.S. envoy to Yemen was present there. And he came to speak to the uh, uh, team of uh, Sana'a government negotiators, saying to them, you must accept what is being put to you. And if you don't accept that, we will re 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 relocate the central bank from uh, Sana'a. We will deny you food and medicine. We will close the airport. We will, we will, we will. He made these direct th threats verbatim. Everything that is, that's happening, closure of the Sana'a airport, he threatened that, this the US envoy. Uh, detention of the, uh, or piracy of the ships uh, carrying food and fuel to Yemen, he threatened that. Um, he also threatened relocation of the central bank. He, he has done it. And so people are not being paid their salaries because there is this illegality going on. No country, nobody has a right to relocate the central, the central bank of any country. Nobody has any right to close the uh, airport of any capital of any country. Nobody has any right to punish collectively all civilians. All of these things amount to very, very serious violations of the sovereignty of the state of Yemen and crimes against humanity in Yemen. And uh, of course, this wouldn't be happening if there wasn't in the background Britain and the US aiding and abetting it. I'm going to return to uh, Stephen Bell and put this question to you, uh, Steve. It looks like our other speaker has, has, is, is facing uh, co complications, so we get the opportunity to take liberties and speak freely. So I'm going to return to you and say, what do you think uh, uh, we should be doing here in the UK? What should our government be doing? Bearing in mind that it continues to boast about the fact that it is holding the pen to the Yemen file at the UN 
when it clearly seems to have a very, very serious conflict of interest. What is your view about our current government's involvement in this worst man-made humanitarian catastrophe? And what can we do to uh, confront this situation? Well, firstly, to return to, to the way you opened um, your last uh, contribution in terms of the um, uh, UN position um, in support of the so-called international government and the manner in which the British and the American government in particular are um, using this as the basis for the con continued pursuit of the war. Now, I think the first thing that we have to say is, well, this is an extraordinary thing when you think about it. The only country on the Arabian Peninsula which has a serious experience of democracy and civil society, independent civil society, is Yemen. And yet, apparently, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, where no votes are cast for the government, where if you join a trade union or a political party, you will end up inside a prison and probably be tortured. These, go these governments are somehow going to defend democracy in Yemen. This is a ridiculous thing. But, of course, the preoccupation is that the people of Yemen, if left to their own devices, will create a very radical, outward-going, prosperous society, which is quite independent of what the United States and British government wish to do in the Middle East. And that is why from 2011 onwards, basically the, these governments, the British government, the American government and others have done what they can to suppress the will of the Yemeni people. So that's the, the fundamental problem. The immediate problem that we face in Britain is that the British government is even more enthusiastic than the US government in pursuing a continuing to pursue a military government, a military solution um, in Yemen. Clearly, after six years, six full years of war, we're now in the seventh year of, of war, there is no prospect, zero prospect of the coalition um, sustaining a military victory. They've been defeated, They're, they are in a position of an absolute stalemate, and they're falling apart and they are at war with themselves. Still and all, their backers in Britain and in the United States are concerned about their embarrassment, concerned about the failure, and are trying to find a way out, which somehow hides the reality uh, of uh, the uh, situation. And so um, the, what we have to do, um, the... Uh, anti-war movement, progressive people in Britain, the United States and elsewhere, is hold our own governments to account and insist that the truth comes out and we really get to the nub of what the issues are. And so, I, in preparation for this meeting, I thought I'd have a look over some of the most recent diplomatic statements of the, um, the British government. As you know, British government is refusing even a pause in arms sales to uh, Saudi Arabia, whereas Biden has frozen some arms sales. It's unclear the extent of this because he talks in terms of um, the Saudis having the rights to defend themselves. Um, however, there's some limit being imposed from that direction. But from the British government, there's no limit. Right, they're pursuing matters as though it's the March 2015 rather than April uh, 2021. So I looked over some of the most recent diplomatic statements. Uh, Dame Barbara Woodward, who's the ambassador to the UN Security Council, at the UN Security Council meeting on the February the uh, 19th, she said, um, the United Security Council Resolution 21 2417 makes clear that humanitarian access must not be impeded. In addition, government in Yemen restrictions on fuel on, uh, imports are strongly increasing prices. Okay, look, she had a, a short speech, 
And that's the nub of what she said. So let's take that apart. Makes clear, the, the resolution makes clear that humanitarian access must not be impeded. Who's impeding? Who is impeding access? Is it not the United States? Is it not the Britain in supporting the siege of the country? Because that's what they're doing. Nothing in what she said saying somehow we maybe are creating difficulties for the people of Yemen. No, 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 no. Um, the, this wonderful conventional hypocrisy of British uh, government whereby they say one thing and do the exact uh, opposite. And I love this thing about, in addition, the government of Yemen restrictions on fuel imports are, are uh, strongly, sharply increasing prices. Now, there's, there's a fiction for you. The government of Yemen restrictions, excuse me, I do not believe that um, so-called President Hardy is um, maintaining from Riyadh the siege, I think is the Saudi and the Emirates who are maintaining the siege. But of course, the British government can't admit that. Well, let's move on. When she, um, uh, again, a further speech she made to uh, Dame Barbara Woodward now, to the Security Council, when she's rep and talking about the need for a, a political solution rather than a military solution, of course, Britain is pursuing a military solution by continuing to arm the Saudis, but that doesn't rate a mention. So, um, but the UK government apparently strongly condemns the escalation of military action in Marib. Well, one can argue about that. Um, there's obviously uh, military action continuing in Marib. But what's notable is there is not a single word from her, not a single word about the continued military action of the coalition. And it takes two to tango. There will be a continued war if you continue to uh, wage an aggressive intervention as the coalition is. I love the next point she made, where she calls for an independent investigation about the fatal fire at the migrant centre in Sana. Now, clearly that was a tragedy. I'm not in a position to understand all the details of it. The reports I read indicated that some, there have been arrests made in Sana and that there is an investigation underway. Good. Those people deserve justice. But I have to find it incredible when there is this demand from a senior diplomat on behalf of the British government for an independent investigation into one fire, terrible though it was, whereas the British government has done everything possible to prevent an independent investigation into the war crimes of the coalition throughout these five, six, and now seventh year. Incredible. So, this is the manner in which that they are approaching it. On the one hand, there is these nice formal positions which they claim to be defending, whether it's uh, humanitarian action, access, democracy, and so on. On the other hand, they're pursuing a war, maintaining a siege, and um, denying the people of Yemen any um, real um, self-determination. So I think that what we have to do is build and continue some of the work that we have been doing. I think all of us were delighted with the International Day of Action that took place on January the 25th when uh, across the world um, people took what action they possibly could. I know since that time a num uh, there have been actions um, in, uh, in Britain on the March the 26th, on the anniversary, we organized a um, major political um, uh, rally. Uh, had to be online, unfortunately, but that's the world we live in at the moment. And meanwhile, um, serious actions took place in North America, other European countries and so on, as well as, of course, the mobilization of the people of Yemen itself um, on that day. So we have to continue this work. I'm very encouraged by some of the recent developments inside the um, United States from the United States peace movement. Just this week, for example, we're dealing, we've seen 
a, a sit-in near the White House, led by or one of the leaders of which was Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. At the moment, students are on hunger strike in the United States in support of the people of Yemen, demanding that the um, US government lifts the uh, siege. And a, uh, 60 organizations with some considerable authority uh, have written an open letter to Biden demanding the lifting of the siege. Now, these types of initiatives in the United States are clearly very, very significant. And these are the types of things which we have to build on internationally to ensure that there is a counterforce to the official diplomacy and the official cover up and lies that we are having to deal with. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was very, very powerful, refreshing analysis and comments that you have uh, read out to us from the uh, uh, representative of the UK at the uh, UN Security Council, Dame Barbara. Like you quite rightly said, there is a oat hypocrisy, the height of hypocrisy is there. They're holding the pen, yet they are the party to uh, all of this that's going on. They, they're pretending there is a, a, gov a legitimate government as if they haven't read the Gulf Initiative. Dame Barbara, may I refer you to Clause 7 of the Gulf Initiative? It will show you that what you're referring to as government had its term ended in February 2014. And furthermore, Dame Barbara, there is an, a, a formal letter of resignation tendered by Mr. Hadi shortly before he escaped in women's clothing. And then they, they come back to accuse the, 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 the government of Sana'a, who they refer to as Houthis, of interfering with women and for lawfully or restricting their freedom. If that was the case, then how did Mr. Hadi and uh, Mohsen al-Ahmar, his deputy, and quite a few others, including uh, members of the uh, Saleh family, like Tariq Affash, managed to escape wearing women's clothing. It's been because they know the government of Sana'a wouldn't harass women at all. All you have to do to get away, to escape from the army and the popular committee is dress up as I am doing right here. They would not interfere with you. They respect women. They honor them and they, they, they will not interfere with their dignity or rough handle them as might be the case, for example, in Saudi Arabia or the uh, Emirates where the princesses themselves are being currently held in abysmal conditions and one has just disappeared. We don't know if she's dead or alive. And another one is kept in a cage. Apparently there is a cage inside the palace where the women are imprisoned. Anyhow, that's their affair. Um, but as far as as Yemen is concerned, you, you quite rightly pointed out, Stephen, that, that yes, it is an advanced country and there's great potential for it to be a true democracy in the region. And that's what's really frightening them. That's why they want to suppress that. They prefer dictatorship because that's what they are. And uh, these people have never seen a constitution or a parliament or the proceedings in a parliament. Their parliament is just the living room of the king called the D1. And of course, you've seen the uh, selection process of uh, a king is normally just having a photo they just touch the photo and that's how it how the voting process takes place i have no idea what it is that they're voting voting and under what constitution but that's what happens a bit like a uh, pharaohic practices in a way but uh, that's their affair they have to have their hands off yemen and the suggestion that they have come up with a peaceful uh, solution to the situation in yemen is a pack of lies again just like many other of the lies they've been telling that they have uh, uh, suggested that there be uh, limited flights from Sana'a airport that they will allow some of the ships to dock without after they go through search mechanism etc that and hang on who are they to decide what should come and go out of Yemen Resolution 2216 doesn't allow anybody to use force against the state of Yemen one Two, it doesn't affect the whole of Yemen. Three, the resolution itself is invalid because Russia, a very important member, permanent member, a veto holder, had abstained from voting for that resolution. So that makes it actually illegal. You need to review the uh, internal uh, laws and procedures for the Security Council itself to see how a, a, a resolution that like 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 that should should be passed for it to have the force or the power of law so the regular resolution doesn't apply to the whole of yemen it is uh unlawfully passed and and 
uh, it doesn't em em empower anybody to use force against Yemen. It was passed three weeks after the commencement of the uh, act of aggression against Yemen. So we, the, the, the Saudi coalition, Saudi regime, is a principal party of the aggression on Yemen. It cannot now pretend to be a peace broker. So we can't play the pay part of the peace broker. Britain shouldn't be holding the pen in relation to the Yemen file because it's been deeply involved in the uh, creation of the worst man-made uh, uh, catastrophe on earth in Yemen right from the start. And in every sense of the word, every step taken by the US, Britain has taken it as well. So they are both parties to it. They can't play peace brokers. They can't play independent uh, uh, people on, on the on the file the Yemen file should be taken away from Britain that's as simple as that I mean it seems Britain has old unrequented colonial ambition to regain control of Yemen again because it managed to have control of the south once upon a time until 1967 I don't think it really recovered from the uh, embarrassment of losing control of southern Yemen and yes of course it has that old uh, imperial ambition to regain control and I can assure you I have evidence that confirms Britain has a military base in al Mahra and Socatra as well as al Anat. this will be some other day's investigation for brave journalists to look into and uh, let the public the people of britain know the truth about what's happening under their name because there is a war britain is conducting it via proxies without parliamentary approval and that's a very serious problem for us here and for many other countries in the world if we let it get, uh, uh, pass without there being any questions or accountability. I'm going to return to you, to Dr. Tron, to give you a final say about what you think we should be doing in terms of uh, alleviating the suffering in Yemen and what is the perception of the authorities in Norway as well as the people of uh, Norway about what, what, what they think what's ha is happening in Yemen and do they know what's happening in Yemen and how can we reach out to our brothers and sisters in Norway to let them know what's happening uh, in Yemen and see how we may be able to expand our work and work together. I would like to say before I pass the floor on to you that I would strongly encourage and recommend, highly recommend that people People donate generously to your organization now that we are coming to the month of uh, holy month of Ramadan they must uh, generously donate to your organization because I am confident as I have been working with your organization closely myself that you will be benefiting the most vulnerable people in Yemen and as I have just said there are four million disabled people and your organization is very well uh, equipped and uh, an expert in dealing with situations like this. So I'm going to give you the floor without much ado. And uh, please tell us what, what, what we can be doing further. First, <clears throat> if you allow me a small correction, if anybody wants to donate to this work we are doing now in Yemen, for sure they are not donating to us. They are not donating to our organization. They are for sure donating to the people of Yemen, to the widows, women of the martyrs in this area of Yemen. And we will be happy to deliver support given by you to these people in need. These ladies in this center of women of martyrs. So we hope to hear from you and we hope to cooperate with you. And we hope to develop further these centers and make more centers and do more activities locally among the people of Yemen. That would be a great honor for us. Then it comes to my mind that it is said about the war in Yemen and it is a terrible matter, terrible matter, terrible situation. But at the same time, somehow it is said to be a rather quiet war. It is autocracies going on in Yemen but not much talked about it in television, in newspapers, in radio. It is somehow a quiet war. And then I think we have strength in you experts and other experts. You give us arguments, you give us knowledge, you give us information to stand up and fight further for the people of Yemen. So really your efforts and your information and your knowledge is important for all of us. So it is important we listen to you and we discuss with you and we are together with you and we improve 
our knowledge of uh, and of uh, intentions for the people of Yemen. You asked about the situation in my no country, Norway. And I'm sorry to say that Norway is rather close attached to America, France, England. And when these big powers are quiet about the situation, also the Norwegian press, television, Norwegian politicians are a bit quiet about what's going on. And I'm afraid that I have to admit that this to a large extent also is the situation in Norway. The war in Yemen is not in the headlines and the main spotlights, unfortunately. So this is a great challenge for us with your knowledge, all the experts' knowledge. We have to reach out newspapers to the media and inform what is really going on and what which forces are behind what is going on in Yemen. So this is what we are trying to do on local level, be together with Yemeni people, learn from them, take their knowledge and their experiences into the media in Norway, establish links between people in Norway and people in Yemen, bring us together, and with this strength go out into the media, other places, organizations, and inform them what really is the situation in support of people of Yemen. It is a great chance, a challenge, but this is what we have to do and uh, we will do our best with your assistance and with all other assistance, friends of the people of Yemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been an, an, uh, an amazing honor for me to be in the company of most uh, ex exceptionally brilliant uh, gentlemen, such as your good selves, being uh, showing absolute humanity and support for the people of Yemen. And uh, I hope that uh, people who have been uh, viewing this program have benefited by gaining a lot of information. And uh, I thank you with all my heart on behalf of 30 million people of Yemen for taking the time and making all the, uh, the effort to be here with us to speak about the people of Yemen most eloquently. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We will, this now wraps up our, the, to the end of our program and uh, hopefully we'll be together again in similar uh, events and uh, carry on our work. And uh, I'm always here to assist in any way I can. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you.